Good afternoon. Thanks so much for coming this beautiful afternoon. Uh, my name is Patricia Ruiz Healy. I'm the director of the gallery. And it's such a pleasure to have Johanna Calle next to me and amongst her work, her beautiful works on paper work. And uh, I want to also acknowledge uh, the presence of Julio Perez Navarrete, who is Johanna's husband, and they work together in a lot of, also in a lot of projects. Um, what attracted me to, to Johanna's work uh, is, is her big commitment to, to kind of pushing the boundaries of drawing and working with printmaking and exploring and using very old techniques and literally using old 19th century stones like in the case of a lithograph. So anyway, welcome. Welcome to San Antonio, Johanna, and welcome to Ruiz Hilly Art. Such a pleasure. Thank you, Patricia, for your invitation. I am thrilled to exhibit in San Antonio for the first time. Hopefully it won't be the last. <laughs> Thank you all for being here. Um, I hope this is more like a conversation than a, than a talk. If you would like to make any questions uh, afterwards, or while we are talking about a specific uh, subject matter, please feel welcome, mm -hmm. feel welcome to do so. Absolutely, absolutely. It's, it's, uh, it's just a conversation here, and we're, all, we're always welcoming uh, questions. And no, no, don't worry about interruptions. You're not going to interrupt, uh, because you, you will bring something else to, to the conversation, and that's what is important. But um, first of all, I'd like to start that you, know, you choose the title of the exhibit. Uh, the title of the exhibit is Trauma. Can you tell us a little bit more about the title? Is there a narrative just for the benefit here of the guests and, and also for our video viewers out there? <laughs> <laughs> well, first of all, I thought of a word that would somehow uh, summarize what I wanted to show in San Antonio. And on the other hand, a word that would somehow also summarize um, a white, uh, white structure I have been using in most of my works. So trama in Spanish is uh, a weave, something that has been uh, weaved together, or it also uh, stands for a structure, or uh, somehow a, a textile is made also in a weaved manner. But ultimately, it's a, a word that denotes somehow a certain order. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that was like the starting point in choosing which works I was going to, to, to show in uh, Ruiz Hilly's art mm -hmm. gallery. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, you, did, you, did a, you did a fantastic job. And I think uh, you know, to start with the spiders, the wonderful series of the spiders using the the essay of uh, this anthropology is talking about um, urgent cities, talking about development in, in developing countries. Um, tell us a little bit more about the work. I, I know that you used the text and created a web, and then the spiders are all hand drawn. Um, were you, are we using different spiders, different species? Tell us a little bit uh, about this body of work, please. Uh, well, going uh, back to the first question, uh, trama, this, uh, uh, this spider web is also like a textile, something that has been, uh, has been constructed by a fine line and that involves like uh, many, many uh, rounds or even mm -hmm. a, a, a spiral to go from one point to the other. Uh, this is a, 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 an, animal, an animal weave, um, but, all, but, but what I wanted to, to uh, work with this uh, uh, metaphor of the weave and, uh, and the anthropological text I used uh, as a starting point for those images was that um, the, the text, first of all, is from a woman anthropologist writing on how uh, shanty towns grow at a very fast pace in regard to organized uh, cities. And that is one 
characteristic of uh, cities in developing countries such mm -hmm. as Colombia, such as uh, the capital city like Bogota where I live in. And uh, she compared that, uh, that very fast growth, uh, growth to uh, an organic uh, growth because there is no way to anticipate how, how fast it will get or how big it will get. And uh, that, that is the reason why I transcribed her text in this, in this, uh, in this d drawings. The, the spiders is uh, like a metaphor as well, that is something that is being constructed along, it's, it's, it has a, a pace on its own. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, again, and, and you cannot tell how big it's going to be mm -hmm. or how fast it's going to be finished. Um, and it's also a little bit of a trap. So mm -hmm. you don't know exactly what the consequences will be mm -hmm. uh, once it is it is finished. Mm -hmm. But do you do you see the spider as a protecting uh, element of the city? As a you have mm -hmm. a metaphor there? Have you thought about that? Well, no, not exactly. Once you start doing a, an image, uh, some of the aspects are things you cannot uh, you cannot. Um, uh, define mm -hmm. uh, in, in beforehand. Mm -hmm. What I liked uh, was to have this, this web made of words that uh, somehow related to an urban mm -hmm. construction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's good, That's good. Uh, now with, um, with song, these two works they're called Song One and Song Two, and it's about musical notation and a lot of your previous work also allude to music and singing. Uh, what is your interest and connection to music? Uh, do you have a musical background? Uh, what is the significant connection specifically with the Gregorian chant? Right, I have, uh, I have been using songs and uh, musical notation in other works uh, throughout my the, the last, uh, last uh, I don't know, five or six years, probably uh, even before that. I think, um, well, one of my main interests is uh, to address language, to address signs, um, metaphors, uh, dialects. Mm -hmm. So music somehow fits uh, very well into, into that uh, broad, uh, interest of mine. Mm -hmm. um, when doing these songs, I, I, I had in mind these Gregorian chants because they are all vocal, there, is, there are no instruments. No um, instruments, yeah. No instruments, so it's just human voice, like making, uh, m m uh, having a rhythm and having this, um, a, um, a big stress on sound mm -hmm. um, and uh, sound at the same time has a lot to do with uh, phonetics which is another main subject I have been working. So I thought in, uh, in regard to this exhibition I, I wanted to have several different uh, subject matters that uh, would show like a general view of what uh, what are my main interests uh, when mm -hmm. doing art? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Language is yes. also very yes. important. Yeah. So music is somehow a, um, a, a sort of language. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Uh, now, many of these, uh, these work also play off with ledgers and making disorder out of forms of order. Can you tell us how your father, who was an accountant, may have influenced these works? Uh, well, again, a ledger structure is somehow a weave, a weave that allows us to know exactly where the sums and where the subtractions uh, have to be. Um, my, my father was a, a self-taught man, and he <coughs> thought uh, uh, accounting was like a, a, a very important thing to learn in life. So from very early age, he, he was like um, 
<coughs> teaching my sister and, and I uh, that we should keep records of things. Mm -hmm. And those records started as numbers, of course, but then I, I, I kept having records of many other things in life, trying to structure. Uh, sometimes I did not uh, accomplish to have this order, but it was like uh, making lists and writing down uh, things, and I think, of course, that uh, somehow influenced the way of thinking and the mm -hmm. way of uh, trying to keep track of other things, mm -hmm. like daily, um, sometimes unimportant, uh, unimportant records. I keep diaries, I keep... Uh, I, I like to have like a notebook for each, uh, mostly each of the works I do, mm -hmm. um, and somehow, somehow that uh, that is also like a, a way of of working, a methodology that mm -hmm. I have been following, mm -hmm. uh, m maybe unconsciously because sometimes it's not just these records of numbers, but something else, but I think it started there. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. As, a, as, a, as a structure. Yes. And um, I'm, I'm very... Uh, please. So, yeah, sure. I, must, um, I understood my grandfather, I used to have a business, so there was all this paper left over, which I spent all my childhood drawing and writing of this kind of paper, and I was wondering whether it created a sensibility for you to use a lot of vintage materials. In your, in, in your work, if it comes from there or from mm -hmm. some other? Well, um, there is a, a very strong interest in uh, trying to find uh, like a way to addressing to certain subject matters in a most, <coughs> more symbolic way. So in, in the case of, perhaps it's easier if I, I uh, put an example, in one of the works that is right here, that is uh, uh, printed on an uh, original stock uh, note, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, it is important to me to find such uh, materials because somehow it stresses the idea of what I do afterwards. Um, vintage, vintage paper is something that is uh, very rare to find in a, in a specific state. Uh, that is part of the research uh, on materials uh, my husband Julio and I do. Uh, we search all the time. It's not by chance that we say, oh, uh, that, that, uh, is, uh, that stock is a beautiful paper. Uh, there must be like a reason to use it and there must be a research on what kind of uh, stocks they are, where they were printed, mm -hmm. in what uh, uh, time lapse uh, and uh, maybe I, I can go into that uh, particular piece uh, briefly. Um, it is from the 1940s. It has been made uh, in lithograph uh, with three, three, ink, three different inks. That means that it has been printed in three different uh, stages, three different uh, mm. matrices. And that involves like a very long process, a specific paper that was uh, imported, that was uh, very difficult to forge, you say? To uh, forge, to, to forge. Mm -hmm. uh, so using the back of that uh, mm. somehow is also saying, although this is obsolete, there was a, there was a reason for, for them to use that specific paper and not another one. It was like almost like a banknote, uh, mm -hmm. something that had a lot of value. So it is. Um, I don't know exactly if that uh, if that is the reason why I like uh, uh, using vintage paper because of my father, but I would say it's more uh, a recent uh, interest to s to to use uh, materials or surfaces that somehow are charged already with a value or with something that is not just a plain, mm -hmm. plain paper or white, uh, but that time has passed already through that uh, material. What do they use the, <laughs> what do they use the material for? Uh, it's, it's actually like a stock of a company that they're not, they're not used anymore and that's another beautiful element it here. 
it used to be like a stock of a company. Let's, let's, like, let's think about the Standard Oil. A Standard Oil will issue X amounts of shares. Mm -hmm. So this is the stock of the share. So it's just a, a, um, it's a company in, in Bogota, in Manizales, that used to handle... So that, 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 do we have a back of the copy? I think we do have mm. the back of the uh, Alana. I think it's like a check thing. Like yeah. Yes, a stock certificate. A stock certificate. It's like this size, a stock certificate, and it says the name of the company, the value of the chair, the date, and, and who belongs to who, be and he belongs to. And yes, so now we in this electronic world, you know, those yes. things are. So it is powerful, powerful. Yes. Yes, it's exactly. And it's the fact that, like she mentioned, that there were three different colors, it's like three different matrices to, to uh, print it. So it was a very, very expensive way to print something. It was not a regular thing that you could buy in a, in in a, a store. In a, in a bookstore, yes. yes in a and, and it is also important that uh, it was from the 1940s mm -hmm. when um, my country, Colombia, in South America, was uh, starting to shift from an agricultural country to an urban country, and then um, they started to have these uh, export businesses to the Caribbean and to Central America, so there was like a wealth involved in it. So, uh, uh, this was a company uh, that exported fruits and that has an importance as well, historical, historical probably this is only an anecdote, but uh, it was an, uh, a company that exported fruit, and there has been uh, a lot of research on uh, banana exporting because the, the, there was a very strong link on how certain parts of the country became like um, wealthy in a very short period of time and how those uh, some some circumstances um, developed in um, in um, uh, class differences and class clashes yeah. and that is somehow also the beginning of um, the, the violencia era that was like all this uh, social unrest and uh, Furthermore, um, a, a social conflict developed from those those years. I don't think that's an anecdote at all. I think that's directly into the world. And uh, now I'm I'm also intrigued, uh, staying with the saldos, uh, you know, the use of the ledger, that I see letters on these ones, and you know, you usually expect numbers, and I know that you did some with numbers. Yes. Uh, Tell me why, or tell us why you use letters instead of numbers in some of the in some of these mm. series of works. Well, sometimes it's a bit of a pun as well, like um. trying to play with words because uh, letras, uh, that is letters in Spanish, also refer to debts. So uh, someone says you have um. to sign me a letter is you have to sign me a compromise or, or a collateral if I lend you money. So that's why I use sometimes numbers or sometimes mm -hmm. just letters. Hmm. But the, the idea is the same. It's something that he's, has been crumbled and is, uh, the order has been altered and cannot be put mm -hmm. back together as it was in its original state. Hmm. I was trying to come out with a with this idea that maybe you were talking about miscommunication and that once, once you, don't, you don't communicate the order, uh, a, a big chaos is created and uh, maybe it's also, maybe it can be part of that, but I, I was just trying to come up with all these different stories <laughs> in my mind. <laughs> well, no, I think that is a, um, a reading that is also, uh, is also valid. valid I, yeah. I don't mean, um, uh, by any means that each uh, work has only uh, one, one meaning or mm -hmm. one possible interpretation. I think one of the strongest uh, uh, 
positive parts about image is that uh, it it has like a universal it's a universal language that uh, communicates in many mm -hmm. different levels mm -hmm. no matter what uh, where the uh, where are you showing it or uh, what the audience uh, audience has has uh, already experienced and knows about work mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now I see that the, we have the, you know the, the oldest work in this uh, exhibit is uh, the little dresses over there from '97, I believe, or '99, and then you have uh, the beautiful image of the missing girl in Colombia. So, are you still working with violence-related work, or you, or those, or, those, or that's more part of your previous work? Mm, I will put it this way. I, I am a woman artist, a Colombian, born in Colombia, uh, who lives in Bogota, the capital city. And all my work is somehow related to who I am, where I live, and where I work. So it's not a, a matter of saying that uh, a subject matter is already done mm -hmm. and perhaps discarded. Uh, but every time I, I research on a specific uh, theme, mm -hmm. there is always like uh, something in the background. Perhaps mm -hmm. I have already addressed uh, that subject matter, or that subject matter is still uh, relevant within the within mm -hmm. the society and in the in the time being. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I have. Uh, done several works relating to uh, to gender to childhood to masculinity mm -hmm. to to violence within a very uh, small family nucleus mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is the case of the lithograph or, or over there um, but it's some it's something that is always uh, underlined mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. uh, i wouldn't say yeah, that's, you're right. That is something that I did in the past, and I will never. Uh, yeah, and I, I and I take it back because you actually, uh, you actually address violence with the uh, very recent work of the missing uh, students from Mexico. Mm -hmm. I was very touched. Uh, was that a lot in the news in Bogota? This uh, I'm talking about the 43 students that disappeared in Mexico uh, in 2000, about two years ago. Uh, so when I g got the information from Johanna about this work, I was like, was it very, you were reading a lot about the missing students and so that really kind of touched you to, to create this unique artist book? Well, sometimes when I pick a subject matter, it's because it uh, somehow exemplifies many mm, other cases yeah. that are somehow related. In our country, uh, disappearances have been uh, very common and have been like a recurrent uh, thing. And uh, I, uh, I was really touched because of these uh, uh, disappearances in Mexico were students. So, and not just any any student, but they were studying to become. Teachers. teachers. Mm -hmm. So these were uh, people with a very special sensibility and uh, a compromise towards mm -hmm. society. And uh, I thought their cases had to be somehow uh, talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, there were many news about it, but I always related uh, that specific case in Mexico with many other than mm -hmm. what had happened. Mm -hmm. In, in my country, so they were not just anonymous people, they mm -hmm. were people who had a, a, a goal uh, in the near future mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, that, that had like all, all their chances, they had already uh, been bro mm -hmm. brought up and had a, a secondary ex mm -hmm. education that in our countries to be educated or, or to have a certain level of education is already like a like a privilege. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So uh, I, I I thought their case was worth it was like a double tragedy. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Go on. I'm, I'm interested in the relationship between trauma 
is a Spanish word for order and the English word trauma, which is only one letter difference, which is about, it certainly refers to the violence, the violent subtext that you're talking about, but could it also you, refers to just disruption. Right. Could you, could you write trauma in English for me, please? Trauma? I just, is it, tra trauma. sorry. Oh, uh, trauma. 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 Ah, we have tra trauma. With a U. T-R-A-U, trauma. Yes. Oh, okay. oh, we have trauma in, yes. in Spanish yeah. as well. I think the, yeah. the etymological roots of both words are very different. So uh, uh, trauma somehow uh, is something that has been affected like uh, uh, physically or mentally to someone. Uh, they, they have nothing to do, it's like a coincidence, but in, in Spanish they are, um, they are very clearly differentiated, so it's not, uh, they're not related. I'm looking at the ledger behind you, that's <laughs> right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, then, uh, you know, of course your work involves a lot of research, um, can you tell us a little bit more about your work evolving from an idea to research material and finally to the finished piece, the finished work? Mm. How do you, how do you, uh, like, uh, how do you start from uh, doing a research, getting an idea of this research and then creating? A little bit, um, bit talk about more about the process. Um. Well, there is a lot of trial and error as well. And okay. The research on materials and how to address in the best way possible uh, the, the subject matter I am uh, addressing. Um, I, I try to, well, I, I read on the, on the subject matter. I try to have like a, a broad uh, perspective before, uh, before I, um, have a solution of um, mm -hmm. how to address. Part of the work I, I uh, do with my husband, with archives, with Julio Cesar Perez, who's here present, is that we buy archives, mm -hmm. we buy material documents, and one of the first things we do is we try to sort out and to identify uh, who was the author, what, uh, what approximate date, uh, the, all those uh, papers or uh, mm -hmm. images or vintage photographs belong to who is depicted. And in doing so, there are many traces. Mm -hmm. uh, a photograph is a first-hand testimony of what happened in a specific, in a specific moment. Sometimes um, moments are depicted in a photograph that have not been uh, studied yet and, or have not mm. been analyzed. Mm -hmm. So uh, what we do is we try to organize somehow or to categorize uh, sometimes very broadly because archives some are, uh, sometimes are huge or sometimes even though there is, it's not so uh, uh, huge in volume, it's very dense. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And in doing that, um, as I said, we find some traces or we find that one archive uh, relates to another one or that there are some things in common. Mm -hmm. And once we find this common term or this common thing, uh, we start to go in depth into, mm -hmm. into that. Um, when we go in depth into some, some of the material, uh, there are traces and there are words and there are cases of, of, uh, of people uh, that sometimes uh, are so strong to, 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 um, uh, to ignore. Mm -hmm. So uh, I just have to follow the lead and Julio is sure. uh, very, very generous that he says if, if you want to work uh, for a, a specific work of art on that, even though we have uh, done the research together, I just go on my own from that point onwards. Mm -hmm. um, so 
uh, I'm sorry, I haven't answered your <laughs> no, 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 your no, question. That's pretty good. That's, that's but uh, usually, what happens is that uh, I, I again want to to answer with an example. Mm -hmm. uh, I have been developing mm -hmm. a process that is called photographic drawings. Mm -hmm. So I mm -hmm. I intervene one specific vintage photograph. It's okay. not a copy, it's not a digital image, it's um, the photographic object, original, that mm -hmm. I find that, that has a re relevance for me. And I start erasing part of the image until oh. I get only the structure of it. Um, sometimes the structure is just one horizontal line mm -hmm. and a few vertical lines that are like the um, like the summary of of the of the image, mostly mm -hmm. uh, these photographic images are um, anonymous, are uh, uh, vernacular that okay. that someone took uh, uh, like a like a snapshot, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and uh, I. I, I follow like what is in the photograph. I try not to invent too much, mm -hmm. like uh, just to respect what someone uh, wanted or, or tried to, to depict from his uh, or her surrounding or from his uh, life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, most recently, uh, you were commissioned by Oh, you were included on this uh, wonderful project by the Modern Art Museum of New York to do to do a valise, to do a box. Uh, can you tell us a little bit more about the project? It's a it's a group, right? It's four artists or five. Um, they invited seven different artists from seven. different backgrounds to um, to reflect on landscape and landscape. Uh, travel. And uh, the idea was very broad in the beginning. It was uh, um, to be able to have like a portable exhibition in one very compact space uh, in, a, in a valise or in a, in a valise that was uh, uh, going to contain all these, all these works. Um, this has been a, a project that uh, took uh, several years to, to develop and to, and to, to, to complete. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, uh, because I had been working with vintage photographs and, uh, uh, and this related so much, um, and, and the photograph related so much to travel and to mm. the memories people want to keep uh, from where they go elsewhere, uh, not from their home. Um, I thought a photo album would be the perfect, uh, the perfect um, uh, proposal. Mm -hmm. So f uh, from the beginning I said I want to make a, a photo album. I didn't know exactly how I was going to, to, to produce it. So I, I designed like a, a accordion-like mm -hmm. photo album so I could show it and display it in one line. To me it was important that there was a narrative, that there was like a rhythm to it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. again a, a grammar. When you see an album uh, there is always like a sequence. Mm -hmm. uh, people don't start with a 1950 uh, photograph and then uh, go back to the 70s. There is always a, an order. So when I proposed May Castelberry, the, the editor, that I wanted to do an, an album, um, she said, well, yes, okay, just, um, just uh, um, several months later I showed her my, my idea, um, but it was, uh, I based the narrative and I based the, the, all the, the, the photographs on a diary of a photograph that would go on foot from one town to the other, mm -hmm. uh, taking portraits. There was a very interesting uh, thing in her in his uh, notebooks that he referred to the to the camera as a portrait camera. So he was not uh, not taking any anything different than people, mm -hmm. and he would take the photograph 
uh, develop, enlarge, and sell the photograph mm -hmm. on site. Mm -hmm. This was a, a, a traveling photographer, perhaps a, a poor man that had no means to, to go from one place to the other, uh, but uh, walking. So in that, in that walking in, and in those notes, he would keep a record of how long in terms of time it would mm -hmm. take him from one town to the other. And I thought that was like a very interesting point to uh, translate into mm -hmm. images that had been um, altered by hand, mm -hmm. one by one, one by hand, one by one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the end, uh, the, the, the end, the proposal was a, um, an, a photo album okay. uh, where you could not recognize the images as such. There was no depiction of a landscape or, or a, a specific person, but there was this idea of a photograph that had um, the silver, uh, gelatin silver effect that when you see a photograph from the 1940s or the 1930s and it's black and white, you can see it has uh, somehow a shine mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the shine uh, is almost like a mirror that doesn't allow mm -hmm. to, to, to see precisely what the image looked like. Uh, so that was the, the idea behind this mm -hmm. album and I transcribed some of the words mm. that I found on the, on the notebooks um, of this uh, photographer uh, related to his travels on foot. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there was another piece in the valise as well. Uh, um, a few um, months before the valise was launched, I would say six months or something like that, Mae um, uh, Castelberry told me that they had chosen an, a writer, an Argentinian writer, to put a piece on, in the valise, and this was Cesar Ayras. And I was intrigued, I hadn't read anything about him, so I started reading, and uh, she said, why don't you uh, make a piece that relates him somehow, would you, would you like to propose something um, mm. after, after his uh, story? So there was an expression that uh, was uh, Paisaje Morfina, which I thought had a lot to do with what he was writing and this very um, Im imaginative or some uh, an image that is only on mm -hmm. your on your head on your mind. Oh, okay. Uh, so I I transcribed part of his text in um, in in precisely that word. So. There are two pieces in the in the valise that I proposed. That was great, fantastic! I'm dying to see it. Uh, it was just launched uh, three weeks ago, three or four weeks, uh, two it, weeks ago. It was launched uh, in. Oh, uh, before, but there was some Arco, in Arco, in Arco Madrid. Okay. Yes, and uh, two or three three weeks ago, at the beginning of April, they launched it uh, the in, in the MoMA itself in. Yes at the library with, uh, with, um, it, within the council of the library. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great, that's great. Uh, one, one last question. Uh, I'm intrigued also by the fact that you study painting and sculpture, you know, very traditional uh, uh, studies at the St. Martin School in, in England, in London. How, when, when did you do the I don't want to say the jump, but when did you make the transition to just work in paper? Um, I did study the BA in, in Colombia and it was like a very, very liberal way of, of learning art. It was more like a, a ex, experience based, like mm -hmm. uh, work in the, in the workshop. When I applied for a scholarship, Mm -hmm. uh, in England, there was only one scholarship to, st to study abroad. Um, I had to choose between oh, okay. sculpture or painting or uh, I think uh, new media or something. 
And uh, the closest thing I had done until then uh, was painting. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really had to learn very fast and very, very thorough how to stretch a canvas, how to use oils, because until then, uh, until I started to do the MA, I had no clue on how to use <laughs> traditional painting methods. And uh, I, I did the MA uh, throughout a year. It was a very intensive course. And I really had to force myself to paint with oils because mm. that was new to me. I just wanted to do the, the master's uh, course. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, having been granted um, a, a, a scholarship was a huge thing. There's only one, one student one in the whole country the that whole gets that country. scholarship, right? Yes, and it was like a big thing also to of go course. to to England and live by myself and be, have the opportunity to study something more in depth. depth. Um, but then um, during the MA, uh, I started uh, noticing that uh, color was like a very, um, was like, uh, I don't know how to put it. <laughs> like, uh, like it, it was very um, uh, protagonic somehow. Ah, protagonic. So most okay. of the paintings I did throughout that year were very monochromatic. Monochromatic, like, okay. Uh, all, all gray, all yellow, all, mm -hmm. all very all minimal. Okay. Very minimal. So it it came to one point that I realized that I was doing drawings in a medium uh, that was not the, the most uh, suited uh -huh. to, to, to draw. So once I graduated, I was relieved. So I didn't have to use <laughs> oils anymore. <laughs> so I switched on to, to paper, to but paint. What, uh, it was a gradual, it okay. was a gradual thing. Yeah. And I kept on, uh, I kept on drawing. Uh, another, another fact, uh, probably very practical, was that uh, in the, in England and because of winter, oil uh, took a long time to dry, and I had a small um, space to to work, so it took ages just to, uh, that I could. Uh, put one of the pieces out while uh, drawing was something I could do and, and finish and have like, mm -hmm. it was a different pace. So uh, d I, in drawing I find, uh, I found such freedom and uh, I, I thought that that was the medium I, I really feel comfortable uh, mm -hmm. with uh, expressing my mm -hmm. ideas. Fantastic. Well, do we have any questions? Sure. <laughs> I don't have to formulate it, so maybe you can tell me. But um, I mean, your work is very individual and very much you coming out of your experience and ideas. But I'm wondering if you've been influenced throughout the history of Latin American art, like a little bit more uh, by Gagaro or um, your Chanel, other artists who use materials. I, I knew the work of Gego very late in my life, so I think that. <laughs> yes. Um, it was like a discovery, like a very em, 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 emot, em, emotive or emotional thing. I, uh, I, had, uh, I had this other scholarship in Paris uh, after I came back from England and had worked uh, several years in, in my hometown. And in Paris, there was this exhibition of, it was a group exhibition, and I saw for the first time these uh, drawings without paper. And they, they had uh, a shadow on the, on the wall, and they were like uh, very fragile objects in themselves, and I thought, that was very beautiful. It was li really like an encounter. Um, just, just as a, a, a parenthesis, uh, 
in Latin America there is something uh, very particular that um, for, for many years now with uh, the web and, and communications is much easier but by the time I was studying art um, you could only hear very seldom what was going on in the other countries in Brazil or in Mexico very seldom but we were more informed what was going on in New York and what was going on in Chicago or LA than in any other uh, country within Latin America. Um, most of the works of Mira Schendel or of Gego, for example, reproduced very badly in a catalog when there, is, there was no, no uh, a lot of images in color that it, it was difficult to understand. So, um, I wouldn't say there is a direct uh, influence. Uh, I'm very fond of their words. I think they were um, very, very brave women to break through uh, a language that was mostly, uh, mostly a, a different uh, aesthetic at that time. And they were also brave to, um, to get a place in a, a male-dominated uh, area, so many other uh, careers that have, have had that, uh, that, that background. So uh, I think both are great artists. Like discovering people, like friends rather than influences. Yes, that is remarkable. And so many years later, after I started uh, doing drawings and and so on. It was like a discovery. <laughs> yes. Any other questions? Yes. I was wondering if you could tell us a bit more about the project that is related to the disappearance of the students in, in Mexico. Mm -hmm. How, what shape will you take? All of that? So um, no, they were uh, prints and they were um, intaglios. I used to one of the uh, accounting ledger structures that has been broken to, uh, to have it um, reproduced as many times as uh, the, 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 the disappeared students. And I thought it was a metaphorical way to, to address uh, one sheet for one person and how this a structure that has been broken uh, relates to a specific case. When, when people disappear, uh, usually um, the, the, the general public, to put it in a way, is struck by the number of uh, people who have been disappeared. So they say 10 people were murdered or five people disappeared and um, when you put it in statistics, it's very difficult to, to really know the uh, to the, the, the length or the importance. The, uh, the relevance. The, the relevance, yes. Mm -hmm. um, it's not the number that makes the, the case uh, worse or more, more, yeah, more gruesome. tragic than other. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if there is one person disappeared, it's as, as, uh, as important and as... Yes, uh, it's one too many, right? It, yes, yes it's, it's too much. So somehow the, the way uh, these cases are counted by numbers and uh, by statistics and not by persons, I thought uh, there was a relationship between this, uh, this ledger and uh, a ledger that has been broken or torn. Um, and I wanted an image that had no ink, something that you would have only with um, plain paper. Um, so I, I had them bound in a very uh, ancient uh, um, a skin type uh, um, cover. Mm -hmm. the, the cover is made of skin, like it's sanded and it looks uh, almost like a, although it is skull, yeah, it's almost like a skin. It, it, it is a skin and the color and so 
um, it has this uh, un underneath uh, reading as, as many, it, it has many levels, so um, it ended up being like a book that you couldn't uh, f uh, bend one page or follow, the, there was like a sequence in it. Mm -hmm. Um, and it became like uh, a book instead of many, many different images. It is something that is uh, bound in one, one case, one, one book. The work is actually here. Yes. So the work is actually here at the end, and uh, we have gloves. We're happy oh, to. Yes, yes, yes. You can actually feel it, weight it, and touch it with gloves. <laughs> yeah, it's like a, it has a beautiful texture because they're all intaglios, so you see the indentation and the breaking of the ledger, mm -hmm. you know. Okay. Yes? I think what you're saying too is um, when you assign people a number, it takes away the humanity of them, in a way. I would say, <laughs> yes, I would say that, it, yeah. that is the case. That would be one of the interpretations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it's, it's like uh, bisecting and making the whole thing so uh, aseptic that you, you forget that there is a, a person behind. Mm -hmm. and a I'm human, a human being. Mm -hmm. Good, any other questions? Well, thank you so much. Thank you for coming. And thank you. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you.